Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Lindsay Langholtz, and I am a director of policy and program at the American Constitution Society, the country's foremost progressive legal organization with more than 200 student and lawyer chapters across the nation. ACS is celebrating its 20th year of shaping legal debate, nurturing the next generation of lawyers, judges, and advocates, and ensuring the law is a force to improve the lives of all people. We are focusing our work in this anniversary year on our Constitution's founding failures when it comes to race and equality in this country and reckoning with our past to create a more just future. If you don't already, we encourage you to follow ACS on social media, including on Twitter at ACS Law, um, where you can find us online at acslaw.org um, and across all the different platforms. Um, you can join ACS and find more information about upcoming events and opportunities. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. First, please note that today's call is being recorded and the recording will be available on our website, which is once again, acslaw.org. Second, if you'd like to ask a question at any time during the call, please type it into the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen. We'll be taking questions after our presenters are finished with their remarks and we'll try to address as many as possible. Finally, one hour of CLE, I'm sorry, California CLE credit is available for this call. Please email us with state of play in the subject line at info at acslaw.org to receive your certificate. If you are seeking CLE credit in a, juris in a jurisdiction other than California, please consult the rules of that state CLE board to see if it provides for reciprocity with California. CLE materials can be found on the event page of the ACS website and will be shared with all participants in a follow-up email. We have a team of experts joining us today to dig in on this timely and important topic, the wave of suppressive voting bills coming out of state legislatures in the wake of the 2020 election. To lead this discussion, we are very fortunate to have Garrett Epps serving as our moderator. Garrett is the legal affairs editor of the Washington Monthly. He previously was a professor of law at the University of Baltimore School of Law, where he taught courses in constitutional law, First Amendment law, and fiction and nonfiction writing for law students. He's been an active contributor to ACS since shortly after its founding. Garrett is a member of ACS's board of directors and board of academic advisors and a regular contributor to our programmatic work. We have a lot of ground to cover, so without further ado, please let me turn it over to Garrett to get us started. Thanks, Lindsay. Uh, I'm excited to be moderating this panel because it gives us, me and us, a chance to learn from people who really know what's going on on the ground uh, in the states and how this whole moment in our history fits into the Constitution and American history generally. Uh, obviously, it's an important issue today. The Brennan Center for Justice said a few weeks ago that they had found more than 160 bills in state legislatures targeting voters' access to the ballot, four times as many as last year, and that it springs out of a myth that has been propagated by former President Trump that the elections are rigged, that there's widespread voter fraud, and that that fraud is being perpetrated uh, largely by black and brown voters. So this is a very important struggle uh, or moment of struggle. I'm gonna introduce each of our speakers and then each of them will talk for eight minutes or so. Uh, and we'll have some time for questions at the end. I'll introduce them in the order they'll speak. Uh, professor Atiba Ellis is professor of law at Marquette University Law School. He's done extensive writing and research on voting rights law and on the question of how Americans conceive of the right to vote and how that influences who gets to vote and who does not. Um, he will talk a little bit about what's going on generally in the state of federal legislation. Edgar Saldivar uh, joined the ACLU of Texas in 2016. He's the senior staff attorney uh, in high impact civil rights and civil liberty uh, litigation, state and federal courts. Uh, he was, formerly was a commercial litigator in private practice uh, and now uh, works on immigrants' rights, voting rights, and government accountability. He'll bring us up to date with what's going on in Texas and uh, to some extent its relationship to both racial and urban rural issues. Uh, Poi Winichakul is a staff attorney with the Voting Rights Practice Group of the Southern Poverty Law Center part of the team challenging Georgia Senate Bill 202, which we all know about, 
uh, before joining the Poverty Law Center, she was a judicial law clerk and a co-founder of Launch Progress, a coalition of state-based political action committees focused on supporting young candidates uh, of color. Finally, Mick Warren uh, is with the ACLU of Florida as a staff attorney focusing on voting rights. Uh, before joining the ACLU, he clerked for Judge Leslie Abrams Garner at the U.S. District Court for the Middle District of Georgia. And he will talk about the extent to which what's going on in other states is echoed or not echoed in Florida, and maybe some about the prospects for reform through direct democracy when you don't have a cooperative legislature. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Atiba. Uh, thanks so much for being with us. And uh, it's here. Great. Thank you, Garrett. And thank you, everyone, for attending today. Um, so to lead off this conversation, I thought it appropriate to talk about um, the state of play, as Garrett suggested, but the state of play from the long view. And fortunately, you know, ACS's theme this year is thinking about the founding failures. So I want to approach this topic that way, talking about the founding failure of voting rights and how that has played out in terms of what I'll call three different versions of voter suppression that we've seen in history. And my contention here is that we are likely at a third, if not fourth version of voter suppression, which is, as Garrett suggested, based on this notion of the propaganda of you know, voters who are not worthy of holding the vote, propaganda that is based purely on speculation and rhetoric. Um, in some of my academic work, I've called this the meme of voter fraud, um, but we'll get there in a moment. Now, I'll end by talking about how the acts that are currently in Congress, I'll say a little bit about how those things will address this. But like I said, in my five minutes that I have, I want to take the long view. So the founding failure, the base code of voting rights, if you will, is the fact that the founders made a choice in their constitutional deliberations to lean towards a Republican form of government, which located states as the main vehicle for representation and not the people, right? So they structured a limited direct democracy and limited the direct democracy to one house of one branch of government. This made the default the states in terms of determining the scope and the powers regarding the right to vote. Of course, Congress retained power to legislate about federal elections in the elections clause and other relevant clauses in the original 1789 constitution, but the leverage is given to the states to define the right to vote. Of course, this leads to voter suppression 1.0, which is that the states functioning under a philosophy of virtual representation were quite content to make a value choice as to who's worthy to exercise the vote and who's not. And so this largely focused on white men of property and excluded the poor, excluded women, excluded African-Americans, excluded indigenous people. And so, white men with property were deemed to be worthy. Of course, from the beginning of the um, 19th century to the Civil War, that changed. We saw an evolution towards universal white male suffrage, but oftentimes that deal was struck at the expense of the right to vote for people of color. Now, of course, the Reconstruction Amendment sought to undo that, Certainly the 14th Amendment contains a provision regarding the right to vote and creates a penalty against states who disenfranchise and well-known ACS scholar legendary Fernita Tolson has written extensively about that. And also there's the Fifth Amendment that promises that there will not be discrimination on the basis of voting. Well, that promise of political equality on the basis of race had been betrayed for the century since the creation of the 15th Amendment. And that, in a sense, leads to voter suppression 2.0. The idea that, well, by hyper-regulating the political process 
to make it as hard as possible for people to vote without actually violating the explicit provisions regarding race in the Constitution that you can chase away the voters that you don't like. And so this method, as expressed through poll taxes, literacy tests, felon disenfranchisement, and grandfather clauses, diminished particularly the African-American vote from levels that some historians rate at 70 to 80% during, during Reconstruction to something like 10% by this time a century ago, 1920. Of course, there was other enfranchisement progress, such as the 19th Amendment, but at the same time, the dilemma of race and voting has continued to endure. And this is the legacy that we're confronting right now in this moment. The patch to this voter suppression programming, of course, was the Voting Rights Act. It offered the fulfillment of the promise of equality on the basis of race and voting through codifying the 15th Amendment through Section 2, allowing people to sue, as well as creating Section 5 preclearance, which stopped voter suppression before it could happen by requiring states with a history of racially suppressive activities to get approval from the federal government before they could implement their laws. But of course, there is a 3.0 period here, right? Even after the Voting Rights Act and its tremendous success in enfranchising people of color to obtain the ballot, that, that effort has been fought against within our lifetimes, right? With both structural changes such as gerrymandering that violated the Voting Rights Act, as well as racial gerrymandering that the court confronted in Shaw v. Reno. These sorts of issues, again, put at cost the right to vote. And so there has been this back and forth in terms of federal intervention and the states wanting to subtly disenfranchise. But of course, this uh, is accompanied by partisan gerrymandering and the problem of the race or party as the mechanism for discrimination. Are states trying to discriminate because they Republicans don't like Democrats or Democrats don't like Republicans? Or is it a proxy for race? Certainly courts have split on these issues, but this is part of the larger debate. But this mechanism of hyper-regulation has taken a new life in light of, since we're talking about race and voting, Shelby County v. Holder. Now, of course, we could spend a whole seminar about Shelby County itself, but it's enough to say that it disabled Section 5 by holding unconstitutional the formula to determine which states ought to be under Section 5 preclearance. And there's a lot more I could say, but let me spend this last 30 seconds talking about how the legislation that is before Congress today attempts to right the ship by reasserting federal preeminence in voting rights. The John Lewis Voting, voting Advancement Act would undo what Shelby County did by creating a new preclearance formula. Of course, there is also the For the People Act, also known as HR1, which would establish a number of laws that would do what progressive states are doing in terms of allowing all sorts of avenues for access to the ballot, including online registration, automatic voter registration, and mechanisms that make it easier. But given this and the fact that some of this is happening in other states, we confront a dilemma now, which is that, as one commentator put it, are we in a voter suppression 4.0 era where there might be separate but equal voting rights, depending on which state you're in, whether it's a disenfranchising state or an enabling state? And I'll hand it to my colleagues who will talk about their experiences from their various states. Thanks, Atiba. Uh, next, we'll hear from uh, Edgar. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Edgar Saldivar, he, him. Uh, I'm based in Houston with the ACLU of Texas. Um, and as you know, you may have heard, uh, Texas is currently dealing with uh, a legislation uh, or legislature that is considering some of the most restrictive uh, voting rights across the country. Um, 
already uh, Texas uh, leads the, num the, the nation in the number of restrictive voting bills that have been presented as bills in this legislative session. Um, and you know, it's, it's well known that Texas has some of the most restrictive laws already. The current bills are attempting to make it even more hard and scarier to participate in elections, um, uh, especially for communities of color. Now, these two large bills uh, are getting a lot of the attention. This is Senate Bill 7 and HB 6, House Bill 6. Uh, but there are other pieces of legislation that are independent or uh, collectively as piecemeal legislation, uh, threatening to also do some serious damage to the right to vote in Texas. And I'll just touch on those as well. But to give you a flavor or a sense of the extreme nature of these bills in Texas, I wanna just highlight some of the provisions in Senate Bill 7 and uh, House Bill 6, as well as touch on, on a few provisions from uh, the other smaller bills. They're just as bad. Um, how, uh, Senate Bill 7 would limit uh, the hours that people have access to vote. Uh, this past election, Harris County, for example, implemented a 24-hour uh, voting um, uh, program so that folks from, you know, uh, all walks of life and, and, and people who have different kinds of jobs can, can go vote at their convenience. Uh, the state legislature is now considering uh, cutting those hours in half by in, cutting those hours by half um, and, um, and limiting also voting to weekdays only. Uh, vote by mail limitations are also included in this provision, including prohibiting county clerks from distributing, distributing and soliciting um, information about uh, mail ballot applications. Uh, it makes it more complicated for people to apply to vote by mail by adding risk requirements to the application process. It also uh, allows for uh, state officials to compare uh, signatures of people with uh, signatures that have been in, in, in the county databases and state databases for years. So you can imagine that a person who is say 75, um, that person's signature would be potentially compared to their signature when they were 40. And so, um, as folks know, signatures change and this could potentially disenfranchise a lot of people. Uh, what Senate, Senate bill also does in extreme fashion is it allows poll watchers who, are, who play an important role uh, in elections, but it allows poll watchers to intimidate voters. And that's done by allowing them to have recording devices, allowing them to have free reign at a polling location without the ability and discretion of uh, election officials to keep them away if they're being uh, uh, harassing. Uh, it allows watchers to also send videos, photos, and audio recordings directly to the Secretary of State, who could also send them to the Attorney General. Again, an intimidation tactic that's being considered in this, uh, in this bill. Um, Senate Bill 7 also has uh, it, or in incorporates a formula for redistributing polling places within counties with a population of over a million. So what this means is that in effect, larger counties, urban centers across Texas, where significant uh, portions of minority communities live, uh, those polling locations and voting equipment resources would have to be relocated from urban centers to suburbs, which in Texas tend to be uh, predominantly white. Um, also, it bans drive-through voting, um, which was actually a very uh, effective tool used in the last election in places like Harris County, Harris County being the largest county in Texas where Houston is located. And, um, and, and, in, and in that instance, um, members of the Republican Party locally sued to try to stop drive-through voting and the ACLU of Texas uh, fought back to defend the rights of drive-through voters. Now the state legislature is considering just banning it outright. Um, the SB7 also makes it extremely hard for voters who need assistance. For example, uh, people who will be assisting voters will now be required to fill out a very invasive detailed form um, that uh, requires them to explain their reasons for assistance, something that wasn't required before, even though 
the names and information of these uh, assistants uh, are already recorded in the polls. Uh, it will force people who choose to vote curbside, such as the elderly or people with disabilities, uh, to have any of their passengers wait outside the car, uh, regardless of weather conditions, um, ju just while that person fills out their ballot. Um, so that, that gives you a sense of uh, the extreme ways in which Senate Bill 7 is attempting to limit access to the polls for, uh, for many people, uh, but specifically communities of color, the elderly, the poor, and people with disabilities. Now, House Bill 6, which is uh, another omnibus bill containing multiple provisions, um, that one uh, creates uh, criminal penalties and, and reinforces or um, adds to the penalties that are currently in place for every aspect of the voting process, it seems. One example is um, it would require, uh, well, it would limit information that, that people have access to uh, regarding mail ballots. Uh, again, it, it creates a, still, a state jail felony uh, if a public official uh, or county clerk um, decides to provide information uh, to someone about mail ballot applications when they were not requested specifically. Um, it allows poll watchers again to um, intimidate uh, voters by taking away discretion from poll workers to keep them out. Uh, it makes it a third degree felony, in fact, to, um, uh, excuse me, um, makes it a felony for uh, election workers to keep watchers out. Um, other attempts such as um, assisting, voter, uh, assisting voters or voters with disabilities and programs and organizations that do that kind of work, now it would be illegal to get paid or get compensated for that work. So you can imagine many organizations that work in the voting rights space will be limited in their ability to get information out, to do uh, get out the vote efforts and things like that. Now that's what we're dealing with in the big bills. Uh, to move quickly, given the limited time, to some of the independent bills, uh, um, there's HB 3297, which threatens innocent mistakes on registration applications to second degree felonies. And one of the other bills, HB 1026, would eliminate completely the ability to for volunteers to register people to vote. Again, these are just a flavor of some of the bills. You can visit the ACLU of Texas website for more information on these bills, including the piecemeal legislation that's being considered. And as you can see, our fundamental right to vote in Texas is, um, is at risk. Um, I think that people in power are realizing the shift in demographics could affect them and they're doing what they can within their power to cement that power um, and keep people from voting or making it harder or scarier to vote. And that's uh, what we're dealing with in Texas at this time. Thanks, Edgar. And now, Poi. Thank you. Um, and I just wanna start off by saying thank you so much for having me on this panel. Um, just hearing and being able to learn from all of you has been really interesting for me. Edgar, you basically gave me a whole deja vu of what happened in, in Georgia earlier this year, um, where we saw some similar provisions and even the way that the legislation was moving through the state legislature here had parallels with those, uh, with that in, in, in Texas. Um, so I will uh, try to talk about the Georgia context in which um, I know that SB 202 has been in the news a lot, even, in um, the New York Times has a whole breakdown of the different provisions of the 98 page bill and now law. So I won't go through as much of that, um, but just to give a uh, step back a little bit, I wanted to talk about the context in which the Georgia SB 202 came to be. And it's no, uh, probably not news to any of the viewers here, anyone on the panel about the turmoil and the serious series of elections that Georgia has had uh, this past year, starting with the primary during the height of the pandemic and the long lines, eight, 10 hour lines that people waited in um, and the disparity, obviously the racial disparity um, 
with black and brown voters waiting in those long lines and making it hard, having a harder time casting a ballot than many of their, their white counterpart voters. Um, all the way through the general election and the aftermath of a series and onslaught of lawsuits based in um, the big lie uh, that kept compounding and extenuating um, these baseless allegations um, that the election was not fair or secure. Um, and then we had this historic runoff where the spotlight was on Georgia. And so after all of that, and after so many voters had turned out and the coalition of election protection groups had worked so hard to ensure that everyone could cast a ballot, we get SB 202, which is in stark contrast and, and a clear reaction to the high percentages of voters of color voting, especially by mail, by Dropbox, um, and early voting. And so what you see in SB 202 um, is uh, the compounding and cascading burdens on those particular voters, black and brown voters who use those methods of voting in the, gen the primary, the general election and the runoff elections. So you've got what SB 202 does in its 98 page law is it, it it will restructure the entire election scheme in Georgia. Um, if you are a voter who wants to vote by mail, wanting an absentee ballot, it's going to be harder for you to get one. If you wanna cast that absentee ballot by Dropbox, it's gonna be harder for you to find a Dropbox. If you wanted to vote then early, it reduces the early voting period for runoff elections. If you wanted to then vote in person, there are a number of provisions that then allow the state legislature, which is partisanly controlled, to be able to swoop in and affect election administration, threatening whether or not your vote can actually be counted. And so at every step of the way is going to make it harder for a voter to cast their ballot and have it counted. Um, and that is why, um, you know, SPLC is one of the uh, organizations that has uh, has brought a challenge to SB 202 um, under the Voting Rights Act, the First Amendment, 14th and the 15th Amendments. Um, I wanted to also take a little bit of time to talk about Professor Ellis's framing and historical context of these stages of, of um, voter suppression. And I think that it is, uh, it was an extremely salient way to frame the issue um, because we are in a, at a time, I believe, when we're considering what voter suppression is. And it's difficult to understand what voter suppression is, why, it, why making it harder to vote is voter suppression, why long lines are voter suppression, without understanding this broader historical context that Professor Ellis so aptly framed. Um, and in, in, the same, in that vein, I wanted to talk about um, to add a little bit to uh, that I previewed before about the his, um, in terms of the history of voting about about the the terror <laughs> and the extremist nature by which the state and others have uh, have have reacted when black and brown people vote um, and so I think that's important to show that both the recent historical context of Georgia's election stemming from white supremacist extremism and extending to the basis of this legislation, as well as the very long history through the various stages of exclusion, um, Jim Crow, post Shelby County, and until now that Professor Ellis has laid out. So this is all one large context. And um, I can say as also someone who worked through the uh, elections, the general election and the runoff elections, that it was, uh, there were, there were these threats looming all the time, you know, whether it was a direct threat or kind of something looming in the background. Um, and we continue to operate in that, in that environment because of um, the perpetuation of the big lie that underlies the, uh, that underlies SB 202. Finally, and specifically, um, I wanted to address some of the parallels that we are seeing with the various stages that Professor Ellis uh, outlined. So for instance, we're seeing as, uh, as part of the narrative around why SB 202 needs to, uh, came to be, 
Um, and these are narratives that are being perpetuated from the bill sponsors. Um, one, that this, that this bill is, uh, is reasonable, echoes some of the bureau, bureaucratic, um, bureaucratic narrative that we heard um, when, when, you know, purportedly neutral justifications um, for voting uh, restrictions were made during Jim Crow. Yet account a number of, of jelly beans in a jar. Why can't you do that? This seems like a simple thing that everyone could do in order to be able to cast a ballot. There's no, you know, it seems like a neutral justification, some kind of bureaucratic white literacy test. But here, we, uh, many of the justifications here echo that sentiment where reasonableness is not reasonable, it's targeted. Um, uh, the 3.0, this race versus party justification, it's not that um, the bill sponsors are saying, it's not that uh, this bill is, uh, is targeting anyone by race, it's targeting people about party, it's just partisan politics. Um, and that is something that we heard often are still grappling with in, in our jurisprudence. Um, and the basis for that is something we've seen before and we continue to see where um, partisanship or not, this isn't really about that. This is about impacted voters. This is about people who have multiple intersectional identities that make it so hard for them to cast a ballot and the fact that these restrictions target those demographics. And then um, finally, uh, we see now the separate but equal kind of argument. And I will just, I will just uh, say that I think that this is another trap <laughs> that we shouldn't think about uh, comparing George's law to New York's law to anything else. Um, and that while uh, states are laboratories of democracy, um, it's not always that uh, a, a, a law is okay because each state will have its own way of dealing with their own um, voting administration. But if you look at the trend, the trend is to expand access to voting. It's, it is to encourage people to be, uh, to have other forms of ways to vote where, you know, a the, the idea that a laboratory of democracy that a state could enact legislation that would make their administration better by restricting the ballot is is just not a useful comparison based on other other states. So with that, I will yield my time uh, to Nick, who can talk more about Florida. Nick, take it away. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Professor Epps and Poi. Um, a lot of the things that that Poi just said uh, really resonate with us in Florida. Uh, particularly the last comment about um, that we're not we're not we shouldn't be comparing uh, states between each other and and seeing you know what's going on in Florida is not so bad because it's worse in Georgia or in New York it's even uh, more restrictive I and mean, that's the the point is that the state should not be uh, making it harder for people to vote without a very 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 compelling reason and when that the the only reason they can give is the voter fraud meme or the big lie um, that simply doesn't cut it. And, um, and that's exactly what we've seen here in Florida. And it's uh, even more egregious because what uh, we had a very smooth election last year, uh, relatively speaking, uh, especially given um, our track record um, over the last few decades. Um, and, uh, and the governor and secretary of state and the leading legislators all admitted that and said, we have a lot to be proud of in the way that our election was run. Uh, and of course, that's a testament to uh, not only the election administration uh, officials locally and at the state level, but also the hard work of all the election protection coalition and the hardworking folks on the ground um, who were making sure that people who wanted to vote could vote. Um, and despite that, we still have uh, legislators who want to make it even harder. Um, and while even admitting that we didn't really have any issues, we're still going to totally overhaul um, some of the uh, most successful parts of, of the 2020 election. And, um, and to highlight some of those, um, which again, um, I love how Poi described the cumulative effects of these overlapping restrictions, because it's not just that any one uh, any one new change or any one barrier is going to be the thing that keeps someone from casting their ballot. 
um, although it, it very well may, but that the cumulative effect uh, intersecting with uh, the different situations that people have in their lives um, makes it needlessly harder and will prevent people from being able to get a ballot, return it, cast it, have it count. Um, and so uh, just to highlight a few, a few of the things that the, the legislature is poised to pass here, um, thankfully tomorrow is the last day of the legislative session, which they can't leave to Tallahassee soon enough. Um, but like, like has gotten a lot of attention in Georgia, um, the bills in Florida uh, will essentially ban passing out food and water by nonpartisan volunteers at polling places, right? Where do those lines happen? They happen in, uh, in precincts and communities of color that are under-resourced and understaffed. Uh, and that's where people, uh, that's where people, volunteers go to make sure that people aren't going to leave uh, the line because they're hungry or dehydrated in the Florida heat in August when we have our primary, right? Um, there's a whole, uh, a whole uh, range of attacks on voting by mail like we've seen, uh, which has also been really uh, frustrating because for the past 20 years, Florida has had a very robust uh, vote by mail when um, maybe 20 years ago was probably one of the leaders in the country on access to vote by mail. Um, and uh, in just a year, uh, <laughs> was all it took uh, at, for the comments by the president last year uh, to completely change um, how the uh, legislators in Tallahassee uh, viewed vote by mail. And, and so we have cutting in half the am uh, amount of time that your vote by mail request is good for. You're going to have to request it twice as often. Um, you, uh, when you go to uh, turn in your, your mail ballot at a drop box, you have to show a photo ID now, which what's the difference between that and just going to vote in person? Um, to find a drop box in the first place, the hours and locations of drop boxes are severely cut back uh, and restricted. We had uh, this past election, this past year was the, the first time actually that we had uh, officially sanctioned ballot drop boxes in Florida, which was um, a, a good change that the legislature made in 2019. Um, and now a lot of that's being rolled back once, uh, once legislators saw who was taking advantage of that in this past election. Um, there's also uh, lots of new restrictions on um, uh, helping other people handle their mail ballot. So if you are uh, your college roommates want help picking up their ballot at the supervisor's office or uh, want you to drop off their, uh, their mail ballots for them, um, you will have to present ID and prove that you have their authorization to carry their ballot. And if you don't, you'll have to fill out another form under penalty of perjury. Um, for, for certain people, um, when you go to a drop box and, and hand over someone else's ballot, uh, if you don't have an ID, if you don't have a driver's license or social security number, then you have to fill out a special form that gets pulled out and, uh, and is then given special scrutiny uh, and access to the public. And who, uh, who's most likely not to have a social security number or a driver's license, which in Florida uh, is limited only to uh, citizens and people with lawful resident status, um, undocumented immigrants, the families of, of people who may be, uh, who may be citizens and, and, and able to vote. Um, but now you're putting them, their family members in jeopardy uh, and giving them extra scrutiny uh, and that's uh, going to deter those those people from voting. Um, a few other things um, that are concerning because they undermine the administration of elections, um, a ban on private money uh, given to local election administrators, which uh, many supervisors use uh, grants um, to fund the things that they couldn't pay for otherwise, um, because our, our uh, election administration in Florida is almost exclusively funded by local property and sales taxes. And, um, and the state is now taking away that, that money stream without providing anything else in its place. And then there are some other new administrative burdens uh, to the already tight timelines that the supervisors uh, have to deal with. Um, the last piece that I wanna mention 
um, in, in this main bill, SB 90, uh, that's about to pass and others that have, uh, have already passed this session, there's been um, a concerted attack on direct democracy and people's ability to actually, ha actually vote in elections, not just access to the ballot box. For example, there, um, for the past five years or so, the legislature has uh, repeatedly tried to make it as impossible as possible <laughs> to put an initiative on the ballot uh, for a constitutional amendment, which is about the only way we have now left to, um, to advance policy uh, when the legislature refuses to, to do what the voters wanna do. Um, and most significantly uh, in 2018 is how we expanded uh, access to voting for returning citizens that had previously been uh, disenfranchised for life essentially. Um, and, uh, and there's a, the, the latest effort in that uh, would severely restrict fundraising for citizen initiative campaigns. Um, additionally, an amendment slipped into the main election bill a few weeks ago would take away local voters' right to fill vacancies in office when there's a special election coming up. For the past 50 years in Florida, uh, in certain situations, when there's a special election upcoming, and a local office holder resigns, um, the local voters get to have a special election to fill that local office. And, uh, and if this bill passes, the governor will now get to appoint, in most cases, those vacancies. Um, and so um, that is all of a piece with a, a contempt for democracy, a contempt for people's access to the ballot uh, and the voices of the people um, and that, that we're seeing in Florida. Thanks for those presentations. They're, they're pretty sobering. And I think rather than uh, use moderator's privilege, I'm going to go straight to the questions that are stacking up in our question box. Uh, and the first one, and I might throw this at Atiba originally, but anybody who wants to, uh, our questioner says, you know, there really isn't a right to vote in the Constitution. Uh, is there? And it, it really is up to the states to decide who they want to vote and ask this question, which I must say has never occurred to me, uh, could a state decide not to let anybody vote at all? Uh, Atiba, do you wanna go with that? Yeah, so so this is interesting. And, and this is why I can write article after article talking about the right to vote because there's no clear federal constitutional affirmative statement of the right to vote, right? The right to the phrase right to vote appears in the constitution, both in the original text and in the reconstruction amendments and the amendments thereafter. It, but the problem is it keeps referring to the right to vote without actually setting out for purposes of federal elections, what the right to vote is. So, so in essence, this right to vote issue is elusive as a matter of federal law and so the odd part of all this voting rights history is that major federal legislation that has regulated significant parts of the right to vote has served to sort of back define the right to vote. And that's why I went on and on about the Voting Rights Act, right? Um, and, but here's the other thing. In theory, you know, it's, an, it's a neat intellectual exercise for folks that kind of think, well, a state could completely relinquish the right to vote, but one of the fundamental, oh, and by the way, there's an important point I need to make on this, which is that each state affirmatively defines the right to vote in its state constitutions. Because like I said at the very beginning, you know, the default is the state defining the right to vote, but here's the thing, yeah, in theory, you could say, well, a state could abolish their right to vote amendment or pass legislation to not let anyone vote. But there is a federal piece to this as well. In Harper v. Virginia, the Supreme Court of the United States was very clear in saying that once the right to vote is extended, a state cannot arbitrarily retract it. So in that sense, there's this hodgepodge of protections that presumably creates a floor, but then this begs the question of what is the Roberts court 
4.0 going to do in terms of thinking about these things? Yeah, that's great. Anybody else want to weigh in on that? I've always, I grew up in Virginia and I've always said if you could do away with the right to vote entirely, Virginia would certainly have done. Um, the next question is, uh, says, how can a non-litigator who lives in a pro-voting state, so they're not on the front lines of this, get involved in helping to fight these laws, passionate about the issue, feel helpless watching it happen? Um, who wants to weigh in on that first? Yeah, I can <clears throat> I can touch on that, and others can chime in. But uh, you know, we 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 find that uh, a lot of the uh, the work to challenge and fight back against these voter suppression uh, efforts is not done in the courts. It's done out in the streets. It's done through advocacy. And so, uh, to the extent that folks are able to support advocacy efforts, whether it's on the ground or through or, or through some communication with media in states that are currently dealing with these significant threats to voter suppression and our, and our right to vote. Um, I think that would be one avenue to, to help and, and participate and spread the word around about what's going on in these legislatures. Anybody else? Go ahead, Point. I'll add to that, that we um, touched on this a little bit, but there is federal legislation um, happening and moving through Congress that would greatly uh, blunt <laughs> some of our uh, some of the uh, difficulties that we're facing in Florida, Texas, and Georgia, um, and uh, would encourage those to really do that advocacy, target that advocacy towards Congress, so that they can pass, um, for instance. HR 1, um, S 1 for the People Act, as well as HR 4, which hasn't yet been introduced, but will be soon, the John Lewis Voting Rights, John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. Great. Um, here's a question uh, about constitutional interpretation. What can we do to correct current interpretations of the 15th Amendment, which are pretty narrow, so that it's more useful in the voter suppression context? I don't know who wants to jump in first. Atiba, you want to? I mean, the simple answer is um, <clears throat> get a five vote majority that would on the Supreme Court that would be predisposed to that. I think the question alludes to um, City of Mobile versus Bolden, which is a 1982 case where the Supreme Court basically said, in order to demonstrate a violation under the 15th Amendment, um, you have to have in proof of intent to explicitly discriminate on the basis of race. And of course, the problem is no legislator in their right mind will openly air their discriminatory intent. Um, the closest we've come to seeing such a holding in the modern era is North Carolina NAACP versus McCrory, which long story short, Shelby County came down, the North Carolina legislature rushed into action that week and over that summer basically passed the voter suppression bill in the effective dead of night. And basically the fourth circuit found that the way they did it and the fact that they targeted all of the voting preferences enshrined in law that African-Americans supported was a sufficient circumstantial evidence of intentional voter suppression. That's the rare case, right? And, and it would take reversing Bolden or City of Mobile because there are several Bolden as defended cases in order to have a more expansive interpretation but the fact of the matter is people lean on the Voting Rights Act to fill that gap. So, but that throws back to what my friends have just said about passing the John Lewis Act and HR1. Great, thanks. The next question is um, for everybody, I think, but can you describe a little bit about how these vote suppression bills actually affect uh, Latinos, Asian, uh, Pacific Islanders, Native Americans, poor people, you know, so that, uh, you know, to make the argument 
that so people can say, look, here's how it works. This is not just that it's a bad thing. I'm happy to take Anybody? a stab and, and others again can, sure. free, can feel free to add to that. But uh, the voter suppression bills that, that uh, we're seeing in Texas and that we've seen across the country um, target minority groups like Latinos, like Asians, like others uh, in different ways. Um, there are, there are geographic restrictions that uh, apply to people that live in, in communities of color in certain parts of their counties, for example, by forcing county officials to move polling locations and voting machines to other parts of the county where they would be less accessible to them. Uh, there are restrictions on uh, providing assistance to persons. So you can imagine a situation where someone um, is accompanying their, mo their mother or grandmother who only speaks Spanish, for example, and that person will now have to provide an extensive and invasive uh, form in indicating a bunch of information that wasn't previously required uh, about the reasons for providing assistance and things like that, in, this, in essence, making it more complicated. Um, other ways is, um, let's see, um, limiting the hours that people can vote uh, during early voting uh, to specific time periods when a lot of people who work uh, different blue collar jobs uh, might not have the ability to get out and vote, uh, limiting the, uh, the voting to weekdays. Um, there are different ways that, um, uh, does, that it's not just minorities that are affected, but, uh, but people who don't have the economic resources to travel. Um, there are additional documentation requirements uh, to confirm uh, citizenship on some of these bills. So all of this, again, as, as Poi, as Professor Ellis point out, there is a cumulative effect that um, makes it extremely difficult. And in some cases where it's now a crime to make a mistake on filling out a form, um, it's a scary situation for them to go vote. Anybody else want to take a stab at that? I, I think that, I mean, we're seeing very similar similar um, burden on um, voters of color, Asian voters, Latino voters, um, and in, in the SB, in SB 202 and in Georgia. Uh, I just wanna emphasize to this, this other part, it's not just the burdens, right? It's not just the compounding cascading burdens, but it's also this new, or I don't, maybe Professor Ellis can correct me, it's definitely not new the criminalization of voters, right? It's just, it's, it, the burden is on the voter to cast a ballot without justification for these restrictions at all. And it is the extended threat of criminalization. Who are the populations who are more at risk of facing criminal penalties um, and, and feeling those criminal penalties? They are um, voters of color, communities of color who are targeted and, and persecuted. <laughs> um, and so we, uh, this is something that we're seeing in every aspect. If you don't fill out a form right, if you don't hand in an, a ballot the correct way um, and heightening the burden to do that, you could go to jail. Um, and that is a serious, serious risk for a lot of communities. I'll just so yeah, go ahead. I'll just simply say, um, Poi, you are absolutely correct. I'll just make the point of what's the difference between being afraid to fill out a form under penalty of being declared a felon, and then ironically, then having to have a whole system of burdens of reclaiming your right to vote fall upon you due to felon disenfranchisement versus having to pay a poll tax and, and having to keep all your receipts for all your payments and having to show them at the exact same time in order to qualify. And if you miss one, not only do you get ushered out of the polling place, you then also face intimidation and let me say 20 seconds to simply echo the point. And in fact, I wrote notes to myself that I left out the point of intimidation as part of the factor, right? When 
manipulation of the law can't work, then you spread, spread the rhetoric. When the rhetoric doesn't chase people away, you criminalize. If criminalizing doesn't do it, then you attack. And sadly, in 2021, this is what we've seen. What we saw January 6th looked an awful lot like, let's say, the Wilmington riots of 1896 or United States versus Krishank. It's the game repeating itself. Next question is, uh, does anyone want to comment on the influence of the American Legislative Exchange Council, ALEC? Uh, are they behind the fact that there are so many uh, creative uh, ways of, of attacking the ballot that are going being done in multiple states? Did any of you all see that on the ground? I'm uh, sensing a groundswell of no. I think there's coordination. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll agree with that. There's there's definitely ideas that um, that are being shared and aren't coming out of nowhere. Um, I think specifically in Florida, um, there's been a lot of changes in this legislative process. Things happened uh, relatively slowly, and, uh, and that not to say that anyone had a lot of notice about anything, but compared to some other states. So there was a lot of changes. There was input from local election officials and others that um, some of the ideas that may have started with ALEC uh, don't all, all, not all of them look uh, exactly like what was uh, circulated at the beginning, I'm sure, or, or heritage, I know. Uh, heritage action, I think, has, has been identified as a common link between a lot of these bills. Yeah, and as, as the viewers pointed out, there are there are many similarities in these bills, so it uh, it makes sense that there would be coordination on this, so that the language is is almost identical in different states. And and another another point to that is that uh, <laughs> there was some in the early drafts of these bills, there were some things that just didn't make any sense in the context of our election laws here in this state. Uh, and so, you know, we definitely knew that it wasn't the Florida bill drafters who were writing that because it just, and those parts got taken out because again, they just didn't make any sense. And I'll just simply add that this would be consistent with the pattern. We saw the same thing with voter identification bills. We've, you know, between ALEC and Heritage, there is this movement to both give model legislation, build a movement, if you will, um, and, and sort of, you know, talk the rhetoric of fair and simple by making it harsher, by repeating the big lie over and over again so that people are persuaded. So back to how you can get involved, find ways to defeat the big lie, right? find ways to convince folks to A, show up and vote, B, get people registered to vote, and C, hold your legislators to account. You know, that, that is really good advice. And I think uh, on that note, we probably, uh, we've got a hard stop at the top of the hour. So I think we could adjourn. Uh, I hope everybody at home will kind of Jazz hands for me to thank this fabulous panel. Uh, you guys were great. And I know that uh, I learned in a, a lot and you know there are a lot of people who have questions and wanna get involved in that issue. I hope they will uh, reach out to their local, uh, either the ACLU, the American Constitution Society has local lawyer chapters and campus chapters. There are a lot of ways to keep tracking this and be involved. And I wanna thank everybody for taking the time to come out today particularly uh, our panelists. You guys were great. Thank you all so much. I will, I will add my thanks and um, remind folks who are watching that ACS has our convention coming up in June. So be looking at our website, acslaw.org. Um, as we roll out details on that, there'll be lots more interesting and stimulating conversation and also information on all of our upcoming events. So thank you very much to our panelists. We so appreciate your time especially with all the fights that you are currently in the middle of. Um, and I hope everyone has a great rest of the day.